we'll jump into this uh, if 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 we can. Like, how in God's name does a black musician start talking clan guys into quitting a clan? How, how's a guy who's hanging out with Chuck Berry? <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, uh, you, you want to talk about Chuck Berry. Well, you know, Chuck, um, he integrated audiences. And if you think yeah. about it, back, you know, back in the day, uh, in the 1940s and 50s, um, theaters, concert venues were segregated if they allowed Black people in, in the building at all. There were ropes going around the chairs with, sign, with signs hanging down from the ropes that would say seating for white patrons only, colored seating only. So if you and I, you know, went to go see Tommy Dorsey or Glenn Miller or somebody in the 1940s, you and I could not sit together. That was against the law. And if you broke the law, you get arrested, just like Rosa Parks in the bus. You know, it was stupid, but it was against the law. She violated the law, she got arrested, right? So in the 1950s, those uh, Jim Crow laws were still in place. But two phenomenons happened. One, uh, the invention of uh, rock and roll by, uh, by black people like Chuck Berry, Little right. Richard, Bo Diddley, Fast Domino, and the popularization of that music by the uh, great white artists like Elvis Presley, uh, Jerry Lee Lewis, Carl Perkins, Bill Haley and the Comets, Buddy Holly, et cetera, et cetera. And, but, the, but, the, but the seating laws were still in place. I had to sit in a different section. Well, the other phenomenon that happened was when, you know, prior to, to rock and roll, when people like Frank Sinatra would play or or, or the Glenn Miller or Tommy Dorsey or whoever, people stayed in their seating sections. They did not cross sit, right. now, they obeyed the law. But with this rock and roll thing, white kids and black kids could not sit still. This new yeah. beat, you know, boom, boom, bop, boom, boom, bop, you know, with that boogie woogie, boom, 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 you know, they couldn't sit still. They bounced up out of their seats. They started flailing around, knocking over the signs. And you had black kids and white kids dancing together for the first time in the history of this country. That had never happened before. And these black kids and white kids didn't even know each other. Because right. keep in mind, in the 1950s, schools were still segregated. So the white kids and black kids, you know, they might, they might know each other because they see them out there on the street, but they did not go to school together. They did not know each other's names. And yet they're in this concert house, this theater, boogieing and dancing to this new music. And of course that pissed off the white establishment because this black music was corrupting. Subversive. Yeah, yeah, subversive. Watch you know, out. Corrupting white youth, you know, and all that kind of stuff. So, so they banned rock and roll concerts from coming to their towns, not just in the South, but even in the North. The cops would come in, shut right. down the show, pull the plugs, you know, and say, yeah, this is it, you know, this is over. No more rock and roll because it's causing race mixing. And uh, so, you know, Chuck Berry is responsible for a lot of that. And uh, he, he, he and other rock and rollers, Elvis and whoever else, are undercredited because while you had the great civil rights leaders, both black and white, like Martin Luther King and Rosa Parks and many others, while they were marching, having sit-ins and demonstrations and boycotts in order to bring white adults and black adults together, these rock and roll pioneers were already achieving that with uh, black and white youth. So- Yeah, wow. Well, <laughs> I mean, just speaking speaking to people on a much more human level, and, and you know, mu a larger question about how music is probably one of the great unifiers throughout the history of Absol mankind. Absolutely, right? absolutely. So back to your original question, uh, you know, how did I how did I go from being a musician to talking to the Klan? Well, we have to go backwards, back to when I was a child. I'm 62 years old now, and when I was a kid, my parents were in the U.S. Foreign Service, so I grew up as an American Embassy brat. My father was one of the first black uh, secret service agents in this country. My dad wanted to be an FBI agent. And uh, J. Edgar Hoover, of course, was a racist, among other things. And he wasn't hiring any women and, and no blacks. So my, right. dad went, you know, yeah, my dad went to the secret service. And uh, Harry Anslinger was the head of the secret service back then. And he hired five black people at one time. And my dad was one of those five. And wow. Was, yeah. And so he was assigned to the, um, back then the Secret Service was part of the Treasury Department. And right. you know, they had you know, the White House detail, but they also had a drug detail. It was called the uh, FBN, Federal Bureau of Narcotics, and, uh, and the BNDD, uh, Bureau of Narcotics and Dangerous Drugs. The, the, it, was, it was the same agency within the Secret Service. 
So my right. dad was, was, an, was an undercover uh, see, um, secret service agent, you know, working, working on the drug thing. And wow. um, he worked on the French Connection uh, with our Interpol and all that. Wow. And uh, so he, um, he spoke, my, my dad spoke nine languages. He just had a knack for languages. And um, yeah, he spoke nine languages. I don't hardly speak one. <laughs> Me neither, right? <laughs> and so he could read and write in four, in four of them, but he spoke nine. And wow. when uh, Richard Nixon was vice president to uh, Dwight Eisenhower, uh, he had the kitchen debate with uh, Nikita Khrushchev over okay. in Moscow. Well, so the State Department put out this, you know, um, this thing looking for Americans who were fluent in Russian to apply for the job as interpreter. Your dad. Yeah, my dad, my dad spoke Russian, you know. So my dad applied for the job to go with Nixon to Russia as an interpreter, and he got the gig. So he went and uh, he, he interpreted for Nixon and Khrushchev. And when he came back, Nixon told Eisenhower about my dad and what, a, you know, what kind of job he did, et cetera. So they called him into the White House and they told him that he had gone as high as he could go in the Secret Service for a black man. You know, there was a, still a ceiling, right? It got to the point right. where, he was, where he was training white agents who were getting promoted over him because they weren't right. gonna promote a black person. So they said, you've gone as high as you can go in the Secret Service why don't you take the foreign service exam and you can go higher in the foreign service? So my dad took the foreign service exam, he passed it. And uh, next thing you know, he's a foreign service officer. And uh, again, there was a ceiling there too, but he, right. he was able to go higher than he was in the secret service. So we wow. began traveling abroad and I, I started traveling at the age of three in 1961. My first exposure to school, like kindergarten and things uh, was, was overseas. And you, you go to a country, you're there for two years, you come back home here to the States, you're here for a few months, maybe a year, you go back overseas to another country, back and forth, back and forth. So all of my formative years, I was overseas, back and forth. Well, in school, when I was overseas, my classrooms were filled with kids from all the other embassies that were there. So my classmates were Nigerian, Italian, French, Japanese, German, Australian, whoever had an embassy there, all of their kids went to the same school. So my classroom was like a United Nations of little kids. Right. And that was my first exposure to school in a multicultural environment. But when I would come back home here to my own country, I would either be in all black schools or black and white schools, meaning the still segregated or the newly integrated. And there was not the amount of diversity in my classroom here that I had overseas back in the 1960s, right? So when I was overseas, I was literally living about 10 years into the future because that, wow. that, that right. diversity had yet to come here. And um, so I was already prepared for it when it did. Unfortunately, many people here were not. And um, you know, today as a professional musician, I travel around the world, uh, learning as much as I can, seeing as much as I can, performing around the world. So when you combine my childhood travels with my adulthood travels, I've now been in a total of 57 different countries on six wow. continents. And so I've been exposed to a, to a multitude of ethnicities, colors of skin, languages, cultures, right. religions, and all of that has, has helped shape who I've become. And no matter how far I go from this country, whether it's right next door to Canada or to Mexico or halfway around the planet, and no matter how many kinds of different people I meet, when I come back home here, I conclude one thing. We all are human beings. And as such, we all want the same basic five core elements in our life. We want to be loved. We want to be heard. We want to be respected. We want to be treated fairly. And we want the same thing for our family as anybody else wants for their family. So if we are able to keep those five core elements in mind and practice them as we navigate society, whether it's domestic society or international society or the society of white supremacy, we will, we will navigate that society a lot smoother if we keep those five core values in mind. So- All right, I got, I'm gonna interrupt you. I got a couple mm -hmm. observations I wanna make, but I, I know that Derek probably wants to jump in here with a couple of things that he's thinking about. So I'm gonna ask him what, you know, what's on his mind right now. That lays out beautifully everything that you and I have talked about ad nauseum since 2001, right? especially the two core principles of being heard, respected. Loved, yes, that's in there too. Treated fairly, yes, but heard and respected 
And it struck me as you were going through that, Daryl, that, that y- you at an early age had a breadth of diverse experiences, which almost forced your hand into understanding other people. You, it was, it was, it was a, it was a virtual um, petri dish for you to experiment with other cultures and see what the lay of the land looks like from the perspective of of someone from France or someone from Nigeria or where, where whatever other country was in country with you, um, and so just in that ten minute soliloquy, it it starts to make it easier for me to understand how you do what you do. Now, that, that's my initial thought, Chris. Yeah, wow. Yeah, that was a All stepping right, so stone for sure. Back up just a little bit of observation between you and your dad. Mm-hmm. I mean, uh, a, a language ability, which is, you know, I, I don't know languages, but I, from what my understanding is that there's a, there's a certain, I think a certain grasp of natural grasp of math there. And you're got a musical ability, and I, which I don't have, which I'm told also is a certain grasp of math. I mean, there's an underlying DNA here in the bones between you and your dad, which I find really interesting. And my mother was a math teacher. <laughs> <laughs> but I wonder if she, you know, I wonder if she was perfect for the two of you guys, huh? Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. So one of these, uh, one of these times we came back home uh, was 1968. I was age 10 in the fourth grade. And I went to went to a school, an elementary school, in a place called Belmont, Massachusetts, which is a suburb of uh, Boston, right up, right right next door to Cambridge. I could walk to Cambridge from Belmont. And uh, uh, I was in fourth grade, and there was a little black girl in second grade. That was it. So consequently, all of my friends were white, and mostly fourth and fifth graders. And several of my guy friends were members of the Cub Scouts, and they invited me to join. So I joined. I was the only black scout in the area, you know, and I was treated very well, had a good time, learned a lot of stuff. We had a parade from Lexington to Concord, Massachusetts, which is right next door to Belmont, to commemorate the ride of Paul Revere. And uh, it was a Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, Cub Scouts, Brownies, 4-H Club, a bunch of different organizations. I'm the only black person there. And the streets were lined, sidewalks were lined with nothing but white people. And they were cheering and waving and yelling the British are coming and all that kind of stuff. (laughs) <laughs> and um, <laughs> so we're marching and it, we got to some point in the parade route where suddenly I was getting hit with uh, bottles and soda pop cans and, and small rocks and debris from the street by just hey. a, sm- yeah, by a small group of spectators off to my right. I remember it being two kids, maybe a year or two older than me and a couple of adults who were throwing things. It wasn't everybody, just these, this little group here. And because I had no precedent for this kind of behavior. Right. Um, I thought these people over here, my first initial reaction was, oh, they don't like the scouts. That's how naive I was. <laughs> I, yeah, I, I didn't realize I was the only scout getting hit until my, my troop leaders all came running and they huddled over me with their bodies and they escorted me out of the danger. And I kept asking them, why, why are they hitting me? I didn't do anything, why, why are they hitting me? And all they do is just kind of shush me and rush me along telling me everything's gonna be okay, just keep moving, keep moving. And so, um, you know, finally got out of the danger, you know, they didn't follow us or anything like that. And at the end of the day, I went home, my mother and father, you know, were not in attendance at the parade and they were putting band-aids on me and asking me, how did I fall down and get all scraped up? I told them I didn't fall down, I told them what had happened. And for the first time in my life, my mother and father, I'm an only child, they sat me down and explained to me what racism was. Believe it or not, Chris and Derek, at the age of 10, I had never heard the word racism. I had no reason to, because right. you know, it wasn't, it wasn't in, in, in my sphere. And um, I did not understand what they were talking about. And what, what do you mean, the color of my skin? Uh, it, it, it made no sense to me. My 10 year old brain could not process this. And so therefore right. I did not believe my parents. For the first time in my life, I thought my parents were lying to me because I could not comprehend how somebody who had never seen me before, somebody who had never spoken with me and who knew absolutely nothing about me would want to hurt me for no other reason than the color of my skin. It made no sense, right? Right. So I didn't believe them. And uh, about a month and a half, two months later, 
that same year, 1968, April the 4th, Martin Luther King was assassinated. And every major city in this country, my hometown, Chicago, right here, Washington, DC, nearby Boston to Belmont, you name the city, it burned to the ground. All in the name of this new phenomenon that I learned about two months prior called racism. So at that age, so now I understood this thing called racism does exist, but I did not understand why. Why are people racist? So I formed a question in my mind, which was, how can you hate me when you don't even know me? And I right. formed that question back at the age of 10. And um, for the next 52 years, I have been looking for the answer to that question. So now we skip ahead. I graduate college uh, with my degree in music. I become a professional musician. I'm out playing all the time. So I, I joined a country music band. Uh, country music had made a popularity uh, return. And um, I joined this country band. I'm the only black guy in the band, only black guy in most places where we play. Well, we and, play and, and, sorry to interrupt you there. What year is this? This is 1983. 83, okay. Yeah. And um, there was a bar up in Frederick, Maryland, which is about an hour and 20 minutes outside of DC. And it was called the Silver Dollar Lounge. And the Silver Dollar Lounge uh, was known as an all white bar. Not that black people could not go in, but black people did not go in by their own choice. And you know, when you go somewhere where uh, you're not welcome and alcohol is being served, not good combination. A bad mix. Bad mix. The band was, was an established country band in the area. And so they'd been there before. So we just finished playing our first set, came off the bandstand on break. I'm following the band over to the band table, sit down. And I feel somebody come up behind me and put their arm around my shoulder. And I don't know anybody in this joint. So I'm like you know, turning around to see who's touching me. And uh, this white gentleman, maybe 15, 18 years older than me. He says, you know, he really enjoyed our music, you know, and he, I shook his hand and thanked him. And he says, you know, I've seen this here band before but I ain't never seen you before. Where'd you come from? And I said, well, I just joined the band, but yeah, you probably did see them because they told me they played here before, but it's my first time. He says, man, I sure like your piano playing. This is the first time I ever heard a black man play piano like Jerry Lee Lewis. Now I was not offended, but I was rather surprised because this guy was you know, older than me. And you, you would think he would known the, the black origin of Jerry Lee Lewis's style. Right. And I said, well, Jerry Lee got it from the same place I did from black blues and boogie woogie piano players. That's where that rock and roll rockabilly style comes from. Oh, no, 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 Jerry Lee invented that. I ain't never seen no black man play like that except for you. So I'm thinking, okay, well, this guy never saw Little Richard or Fats Domino, you know? Right. But I said, look, man, I said, I know Jerry Lee Lewis. He's a friend of mine. He told me himself where he learned. Guy didn't believe that either. But he was so fascinated, he wanted to buy me a drink when we come back to his table. So I go back to his table. Uh, I ordered a cranberry juice. He pays the waitress. He takes his glass, he clinks my glass and cheers me. And then he says, you know, this is the first time I ever sat down and had a drink with a black man. I'm thinking, what? You know, at that point in my life, I had sat down with thousands, literally thousands of, um, of white people or anybody else and had a meal, a beverage, a conversation. How is it that this man who's older than me had never sat down with somebody outside of his race? Mm. So innocently, I asked myself, why? And he didn't answer me at first. He like looked down at the tabletop, didn't say anything. I asked him again. And his buddy sitting next to him says, tell him, tell him, tell him. I said, tell me. And because now I'm mystified. And um, he says, I'm a member of the Ku Klux Klan. I burst out laughing because now I did not believe him. I know a lot about the Klan because after that experience at age 10 and through my, my uh, adolescent years, I bought every book I could find on black supremacy, white supremacy, the Ku Klux Klan, the neo-Nazis here, the Nazis in Germany, you name it. I got a vast library and I read them all because I'm trying to find out where does that ideology come from? Right. So and in, in reading these books in the Klan, none of them talked about how a Klansman would come up and hug a black guy and praise his talent and want to hang out and buy him a drink. It doesn't work that way. So this right. guy's you know, you know, jerking me around. So I'm laughing going along with the joke. He goes inside his pocket, flips out his wallet, and hands me his clan membership card. I take this down, look at it. I recognize the Ku Klux Klan insignia, which is a red circle with a white cross and a red blood drop in the center. I'm like, oh, you know, this thing is for real. So I stopped laughing and I gave it back to him. 
And now I'm, I'm thinking, what on earth am I doing sitting at a table with a Klansman? But he is very friendly, um, very complimentary. I, I was like a novelty to him or something. And he just wanted to talk about music, where I learned to play. And, you know, he, he was just fascinated. And long story short, he gave me his phone number. And he wanted me to call him whenever I was to return to this bar with this band, because he wanted to bring his friends, meaning Klansmen and Klanswomen friends, to see this black guy. I'm not, I'm not sure he called me a black guy, but to see this black guy play piano like Jerry Lee, because he thought they would be fascinated too. So I said, okay, I'll call you. We were there every six weeks on a rotation with other bands on the weekend. And so I called him like on a Wednesday or Thursday and said, hey man, I'm gonna be down at Silver Dollar, come on out. He'd come out both nights, Friday and Saturday and bring, bring friends. And so on the breaks, you know, I'd make my way over to his table, say hello. Some of these Klansmen and Klanswomen were curious about me. They'd hang there, want to meet me. They'd watch me play. And then, but others, you know, when I start coming in that direction, some of them would like, get up and scoot across the room, go somewhere else. It was like, you know, look, but do not touch kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, which, you know, I didn't care. So, you know, this went on until the end of the year and I quit that band. I went back to playing rock and roll and whatever else. And then it dawned on me a long time later, not, it wasn't immediate. Daryl, the answer to your question that's been plaguing you since the age of 10, how can you hate me when you don't even know me? It fell right into your lap. Who better to ask that question of than someone who would go so far as to join an organization that has over a hundred year history of practicing hating people who don't look like them and who do not believe as they believe. Get back in touch with that Klansman and, and, and get him to set you up with the Grand Dragon or the Imperial Wizard. A Grand Dragon means state leader. Imperial Wizard means national leader. And, and interview these people and, uh, and write a book because all my books have been written by white authors. There have been no book written by a black author on the Klan from the perspective of sitting face to face interviewing them. So mine became the first. So that's what I wanted to do. So I, I got back in touch with this guy and um, he did not want to fix me up with, with the state grand dragon for, for Maryland. The guy's name was Roger Kelly. And uh, he, was, he was too afraid. This guy really liked me. He, and he was afraid that if he were to take me to the grand dragon, that we both would be in trouble. He'd be in trouble, I'd be in trouble. And so he didn't want to do that. And I said, well, listen, give me Mr. Kelly's uh, address and phone number. You know, I, I, I will take care of it. And he's like- I'll go knock on his door. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, I, I was going to do. And, cause I, and so anyway, he didn't want to do that either. But I begged and pleaded for 20 minutes. Finally, he gave me the information on the condition that I not tell Mr. Kelly where I got it. I said, okay, fine. And uh, he warned me, he said, Daryl, do not go to Roger Kelly's house. He will kill you. And I said, well, that's the whole reason. I need to see him. I want to find out why would he kill me? All he, all he sees is my, is my black skin and he goes that crazy that he wants to kill me. And this is what I need to know. This is what I'm trying to understand. He says, please don't go. So anyway, I said, well, I'll, I'll take care of it. So I had my secretary who was white. And I only mentioned that because not that I care, uh, but, but it's, it's an important part of the story. I had Roger Kelly's phone number. I could have called him myself but I did not want, to, want him to detect in my voice that I'm black. Say, I'm not right. talking to you, click. And the whole project would have ended before it ever got started. Right. So I asked her to give him a call. I said, call Mr. Kelly, tell him you're working, you know, your boss is, is uh, writing a book on the Ku Klux Klan. Would he consent to sitting down and giving your boss an interview? However, do not tell Mr. Kelly that I'm black. If he asks, don't lie to him, but don't allude to it. You're getting ready to make this guy's head explode. I'm looking forward to seeing how this oh, works out. Oh, oh it, 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 yeah, you, you'll, you'll love it. It gets better. So she understood. Now, the reason why I didn't want him to know was because, A, I didn't want him to just nix the whole thing over the phone. Um, and, and B, if he knew that I was Black, you know, in advance, and he still agreed to come uh, to interview, he might have different answers prepared in the interim for a Black interviewer than he would have for a white interviewer. So I wanted to be spontaneous, be candid. So she understood. So she called him and she gave him the spiel and he agreed. He didn't ask what color I was. He said, fine. So we set it up at, at, at a motel. In, in fact, it was a motel right above the Silver Dollar Lounge in Frederick, Maryland. All right. And um, yeah, we're 5.15 on a Sunday afternoon. 
Now, Mary and I, we got there super early because, you know, they send out little spies, little clan spies to check things out before they bring their leader, you know, and I didn't Mary's want- Mary's your any... secretary? Huh? Who's Mary? Mary, Mary Barber, my secretary. Yeah, all right. Yeah, so she's, so she's the white lady who called him. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. So, she, so she, she wanted to go with me. I was going to go by myself, but she wanted to come along. So we, she, she came along. We got the room, and we, we were there like several hours in advance to make sure nobody was there to see us. And right. in fact, I sent her in to get the room, and then I entered from another part of the hotel from outside, up the, up the you know, stairs on the outside and go to the room. So I gave her some money. I sent her down the hall to get soda pop out of the machine, put it in the ice bucket, fill it with ice, get it all cold, because I wanted to be hospitable. I had no idea what this man was going to do. Would he come in my room and do the interview? Would he see me and say, I'm not talking to you and walk away? Or would he attack me? Whatever. I want to be prepared to be hospitable. You know, would you have a cold drink? So she got all that set. And the way the room just happened to be was if you're standing in the hallway of the motel, in the doorway, you cannot see who's inside the room. You have to come in the room, turn to your right, and around the corner is the room. So I took the lamp table, took the lamp off, put the table in the most obscure corner of the room. So, you know, you have to come halfway into the room before you see me. And I put a chair on one side for Mr. Kelly, a chair on this side for me. And I had like a black canvas duffel type bag on, on the floor beside my chair. In the bag, I had a cassette recorder, which I put in the center of the table, all in hopes that if he did come in, he would allow me to record the interview. And I had some blank cassettes. I had a copy of the Bible because the Ku Klux Klan claims to be a Christian organization. Right. And, and they claim that the Bible preaches racial separation. Hmm. Now, in my reading of the Bible, I've never seen that. So okay. I want to be able to like, you know, pull out my Bible and say, here, Mr. Kelly, please show me chapter and verse where it says blacks and whites must be separate. So I'm all prepared, right? Right on time to the minute, knock, knock, knock on the door. Um, Mary runs around the corner, opens the door. And um, in comes the, uh, the, the uh, bodyguard. Um, a bodyguard to a grand dragon is known as a grand nighthawk. Um, gr let me just give you the hierarchy of the clan real quick. Wow. Um, <clears throat> if you have a, a, uh, a chapter of your particular clan group in your state and you establish it in another state or in multiple states, you are then considered a national clan group. So therefore you must have a national leader. Like we call our national leader, the president. They call theirs the imperial wizard. Anybody who is prefixed with the title imperial means that person is a national officer. An imperial wizard would be like a president. An imperial caliph would be like a vice president. And then he oversees all the states in which there's a chapter. A state leader, which we would call a governor, they call that person the grand dragon. Anybody on the grand level is, is a uh, state officer, dragon being the top, governor. A, a grand clay lift would be like a lieutenant governor. Within the state, you have uh, counties. We call the county leader, like a county manager, a county executive. That person is known as a great titan. Anybody on the great levels, county level, titan being the top. Uh, within the county, you have districts, with, which they call claverns. And a district leader, we would call a mayor, a councilman, alderman. They call those people uh, exalted cyclops. So, and then below that, just rank and file, plain white robe clansmen. And so uh, Roger Kelly at the time was a grand dragon from Maryland. And uh, he would later become an imperial wizard and national leader. Well, anyway, the bodyguard, the grand nighthawk comes in and he's wearing military fatigues. He has that red circle, white cross patch on his chest here, the initials KKK right here and embroidered on his cap, it said Knights of the Ku Klux Klan. And on his hip, he had a semi-automatic handgun. And he comes in Mr. Kelly is walking right behind him in a dark blue suit and tie. And when the Nighthawk turned the corner and saw me, he like froze. And Mr. Kelly did not realize that his Nighthawk stopped short. So Mr. Kelly hit him in the back, you know, kept on walking and knocked him forward. So now they're stumbling around trying to regain their balance. And they're like looking all over the room, you know, and I'm just sitting there like looking at them, you know, it's a watching Saturday this. Night Live skit. Oh man, it was crazy. And, uh, you know, they're like looking everywhere and I could read their faces like a billboard on the highway. Their faces were saying, did that desk clerk give us the wrong number? You know, or is this an ambush? You know, all these things, there was a lot of anxiety there. So I realized that. So I stood up and I went like this to show I had nothing in my hands. 
Ah. And I walked forward, I put my hand out, and I said, hi, Mr. Kelly, I'm Daryl Davis. He shook my hand, and the Nighthawk shook my hand. So I said, come on in, please, please, come on in, have a seat. Mr. Kelly sat down, and the Nighthawk stood at attention on his right side. Before I could sit down, Mr. Kelly says, Mr. Davis, do you have any form of identification? I said, sure. I gave him my driver's license. He says, oh, you live on such and such street in Silver Spring. Now I'm concerned. Why is this right. man reading my address? You know, is, he, is he gonna come to my house and burn a cross? You know, yeah. All he has to do is look at my name, look at my picture, look at me, match it up and give me back my license. So I did not wanna let him know that he had unnerved me a little bit. Right. But I wanted to let him know that he was not to come to my house uninvited. So I said to him, I said, yes, Mr. Kelly, that is where you live, but you live at, and I named his house number in his street. That way I was leveling the playing field. Right, so right, right. you know where I live, I know where you live. So if you come visit me, I'm gonna come visit you. So we're right. gonna confine all this visiting to this motel room. You know, that was what I was implying by reciting yeah, his yeah, address. Yeah. All right, so he smiled and I did not find out that day. It was months down the road that I had been presumptuous. I had no reason to fear him coming to my house. I had no way of knowing this. One of his clan members lived right down the street here in the next neighborhood over, two neighborhoods over. My street runs pretty long. And so Mr. Kelly, to go to, to go to his member's house, had to go down my street. So he recognized the street name, that's all. It was pure coincidence. And today that clan wow. member, he's, he's in a federal prison in the state of Maine for committing a hate crime. So I had no way of knowing all that at the time. Well, anyway, we got on with this interview. And every time um, Mr. Kelly would, you know, would say, Mr. Davis, the Bible says, I'd reach down, I'd pull out my Bible. Or if the uh, cassette recorder ran out of tape, I'd reach down, I'd pull out a fresh tape. Well, every time I reached down, the Nighthawk reach up, you know, to his yeah. hip, right? Right. And um, I understood that, you know, he's doing his job. You know, he doesn't know what's in my bag. He doesn't know me. Right. So he's doing his job. So that was cool. Um, but after a while, he relaxed. And I yeah. went in and out of the bag. He didn't move. He realized there's no threat in the bag. So we continue right. talking. A little over an hour into this conversation, um, there was just a, Mr. Kelly and I just talking casually. There was a strange noise. It was a very fast, very short noise. Like a, that was it. And we all jumped. <laughs> and, you know, because it came out of nowhere. Yeah. And, and because it happened so fast, it was so short, my ear could not discern what it was, but I perceived it to be an ominous threatening noise. Right. But, you know, I mean, here I am, I'm black. I'm sitting in the room with the KKK. This yeah. guy has a, has a gun. And I'm already told by, by one of his former members that, uh, that this guy would kill me. So, you know, I, I got all this going on in my head and I'm trying to think, what did I just do or say that caused him to make some strange noise that I can't explain? Because I'm blaming him for this noise. I knew he did it because I didn't do it. And I flew up out of my chair and I hit the table because I was getting ready to come across the table. And yeah, I, I was going to attack them. And because I had gone, I, I feared for my life. I had yeah. gone, I'd gone into survival mode. Right, and, right, right. Right. And survival mode, you know, one of four things happens. You know, either you faint because the fear is so great, your brain can't process it and shuts down and you pass out. Or, or your muscles start constricting, you tighten up, you can't move, uh, paralysis by fear. I don't do e Pain either freeze, of those things. Right? Yeah. yeah, I don't do either of those things. The third thing people can do is to run away. Right. And to, in my opinion, that's the best option. As quickly as you can, separate yourself from the source of the fear, get out of there. Right. And I, I would have taken that option had it been available, but I knew you, know, you cannot outrun a bullet in a motel room. And I'm not armed, my secretary is not armed. I see the Nighthawk's gun. I don't know if Mr. Kelly has a weapon up under his suit jacket or not, you know? So the fourth option is to do a preemptive strike, get them right. before they get you. So I was just gonna dive across the table and grab the Nighthawk, grab Mr. Kelly and slam them down to the ground and try to immobilize, you know, that gun. And so when I hit the table, I'm looking right into Mr. Kelly's eyes because I knew he made this, this noise. And I didn't say a word, but my eyes were speaking very loud. And they were asking him, what did you just do? Well, Mr. Kelly's eyes had fixated on my eyes. He didn't say a word either, but I could read his eyes. His eyes were saying to me, what did you just do? And the Nighthawk had his hand on his gun looking at both of us like, what did either one of y'all just do? Well, Mary, 
she was sitting on top of the dresser to my left because there were no more chairs. She realized what had happened and she began explaining it to us when it happened again. And we all began laughing. What happened was the ice in the ice bucket next to her on the dresser <laughs> <laughs> had begun melting and the cans of soda were shifting down the ice. <laughs> that was it. So somebody almost got shot over an ice cube. How ridiculous is that, right? But all in this, in, in the, in this moment, we realized each other's humanity because by that everybody noise, scared. everybody was scared. And then a moment later, everybody's laughing. So we shared those things. I, I won't say that this was the learning moment that would come later, but it was a teaching moment. And the lesson taught was this, all because some foreign an underscore highlight circle of the word foreign entity of which we were ignorant being the bucket of ice Kansas soda we know we'd long forgotten about that you know we were ignorant to it had entered into our little comfort zone via the noise that it made we became fearful of each fear. other yeah so the lesson taught is ignorance breeds fear we fear right. the things of which we're ignorant right right if we do not address that ignorance I mean I'm sorry if we do not address that fear and keep it in check, that fear will escalate and turn into hatred because we hate the things that frighten us. If right. we do not keep the hatred in check and address it, the hatred will escalate and turn into anger, which turns into destruction. We want to right. destroy the things that we hate. Why? Because they frighten us. But guess what? At the end of the day, they're harmless and we were just ignorant. So we saw the whole chain unravel almost to completion. The last component would have been destruction. Had, had the Nighthawk pulled the gun and shot somebody, or had I jumped across the table and hurt one of them, right? So it stopped short of that. But we did see that whole chain go from beginning to completion three years ago in Charlottesville, Virginia, at the, uh, at the big white supremacist rally on August 12th, 2017, where on that day, there was a lot of ignorance in Charlottesville. There was a lot of fear in Charlottesville. There was a lot of hatred in Charlottesville. And what did it culminate in? It culminated in destruction when a white supremacist got inside his car and tried to murder as many counter protesters as he could. He succeeded in injuring 20 and murdering one young lady named Heather Heyer, right? So ignorance breeds fear, fear breeds hatred, hatred breeds destruction. So in my opinion, when you're dealing with individuals you know, most people try to deal with a top-down approach. Everybody takes the cues from the top. That works when you're dealing with systemic racism. You can address it from the top down. But when you're dealing with individuals, it can't be the top-down approach. It has to be the bottom up. We, we spend too much time worrying about the destruction. That's a symptom. Forget about the destruction. The next level down is the hatred. Forget about it. It's another symptom. The fear, forget about it, another symptom address the source, the ignorance. ignorance. If you cure the ignorance, then there's nothing to fear. With nothing to fear, there's nothing to hate. With nothing to hate, there's nothing to destroy. The good thing is there is a cure for ignorance. That cure is called education and exposure. And that's where we need to focus our energy, our time, our money on increasing education and exposure for people to see things that otherwise would not see. And that way you alleviate their ignorance and then they no longer fear, they no longer hate, et cetera. To me also then, you know, the issue is we got to interrupt the chain before we get to the end of the chain. Right. I mean, basically, you know, when I, when I was a hostage negotiator and uh, sitting around and talking with my Israeli brothers and sisters, you know, what they called if there was a, if there was a terrorist that, had, that was on his way to his destination, they needed to interrupt the killing journey. Stop, you know, anywhere along the line, really. I mean, ideally that, you know, you want to interrupt the killing journey much earlier, as early as possible. But there's, you know, the killing journey has a destination. And you can, if you could disrupt it anywhere along the line before they get to the destination, then you got, a, you got an opportunity to interrupt the, the, the killing journey, if you will. So, you know, ideally it's at, it's at an ignorant, ignorance level before so much of this is manifested. But then it, to me, it's also don't give up just because you're not you're not getting in on the ground floor. As long as, right, long as exactly. we're interrupting before we get to the end of the journey, we're in good shape. There was there's a story that I heard, and, and then I'll ask Derek to jump in. 
I heard it from a reliable source. I don't know it to be true, but it's from a reliable source. I haven't backed it up. I was told that uh, Nat King Cole, when he gets ready to go, he's going to buy himself a house in Beverly Hills. Mm-hmm. Now, ain't a lot of black guys when Nat King Cole's buying houses in Beverly Hills. You know, he, chances are he's the only guy rolling in. Mm-hmm. And so instead of just buying and showing up and saying, I'm already bought, he went to the neighborhood, knocked on the door, and held out his hand and said, Hey, I'm Nat. And so, you know, people were caught off guard. He, he gets, you know, he gets into the neighborhood and he integrates fine because he, he went in and he made it personal. You know, some black guy coming in, some foreigner, some someone we're ignorant of, fear of the unknown. And that that breaks down quickly when the guy shows up at his door and holds out his hand and says, hey, I'm not Nat. Not facing a lion's den like you were, you know, but, you know, this this clan guy shows up and you hold out your hand. You say, I'm Daryl. I threw him off his game. Instant game changer in a mm-hmm. non-threatening way. Mm-hmm. Th- exactly. Derek, um, and and you know not, yes that, that that story is true, and I can tell you why it's true. Um, Nat King Cole was originally from Alabama, and um, in Alabama, uh, he was giving a concert. The Klan had protested against allowing him to do this concert because, of course, they were racist, and, and you know they didn't have black people at this particular concert venue, and um, they protested, but the promoters did it anyway. So the Klan showed up. And Nat was at the piano, you know, Nat was not, not only a great singer, but he was also a great pianist. And he was sitting at the piano singing and playing. And this white girl just lost it. She jumped up on stage and went over to the piano and hugged him. You know, this is in the wow. 50s. Yeah. Right. And, wow. and, and the Klan jumped up on stage, hit Nat, knocked him right off the piano bench. He fell over backwards during the concert. And, and slipped some discs in his back, injured his back permanently, permanently. And he said he would never go back to Alabama again. And that's when he relocated to California. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. They tried to kill him. They tried to stab him. Wow. Yeah. Good God. Wow. Yeah. And you would know if he was a play- piano player, wouldn't you? <laughs> oh, absolutely. Absolutely. So, you know, another thing that happens is that I've seen happen, because I've been doing this now for 37 years in between my music gigs, but, um, uh, I show you. I show you the process of what happens. So I, I, I will sit there because it happened so many times, uh, and continues to happen to this day. I'm sitting there with these people, and I'm asking them, you know, so how can you hate me? You don't even know me, man. You know, and all you see. Well, is first of, of all, that's genuine curiosity. You're not yeah. asking them this question out of anger, right? And you told me that the first time that we spoke. Absolutely, I'm curious. I want to know genuine curiosity. Right, because how are you going to address a problem unless you know what the root cause of it is, right? It's just a legitimate question, right? Exactly. You're asking a legitimate question. Exactly. And then I'm told things like, well, Mr. Davis, you know, you know, Black people are, are prone to crime. That's why there are more Black criminals in this country than white people. And that is evidenced by the fact that there are more Black people in prison than white people. Now, what the man is saying is true. There are more Blacks in prison than white people. Um, but it's a half truth because he's not considering the imbalance of our judicial system, right? That puts black people there. And then he goes on to say that, um, that uh, black people are inherently lazy. We don't want to work. We prefer to scam the government welfare system. We always have our hand out for a free, a free you know, freebie or whatever. And then he says that uh, black people are born with a smaller brain than white people. White people have a larger brain. So the larger the brain, the more capacity for intelligence. The smaller the brain, the lower the IQ. And there had been a book out a while back by a fellow named Dr. Charles Murray called The Bell Curve, which was you know, a crock of nonsense. But The Bell Curve more or less proposed that theory that Black, that black people are, are inherently less intelligent than white people. And it was a very popular book, of course. But the Klan doesn't read the book. They just they, they know what it says. They just tote it around as though they read it, you know. So anyway, um, he's telling he tells me that black people have a smaller brain than white people and we're less intelligent. And he said that this is evidenced by the fact that uh, black students consistently, year after year, score lower on the high school SAT scores, scholastic aptitude test. Uh, the, the the black kids scores are always lower. Well, again, that is true. Black kids on the whole score lower than white kids on the SATs. 
but he's not considering the reason why. Right. Um, you know, where do most black kids go to school? In the inner city. Where do most white kids go to school? In the suburbs. It's a fact. Inner city schools are not as good as suburban schools. And I can guarantee you, the black kids who go to school in the suburbs, they score just as high, if not higher, right. than some of the white kids. The white kids who go to school in the inner city, they score just as low, if not lower, than some of the black kids. It has absolutely nothing to do with one's skin color or one's brain size, but it has everything to do with the quality of the educational system in which that student is enrolled. So he's not considering all that. You know, one's perspective is one's reality. Whether that reality is real or not, it's their reality. And That's so, one of the problems with observable data. I mean, yeah. you, you misinterpret your data. Based on our observable data, the sun goes around the earth. Right. Based on our observable data, the sun, because it comes up every morning in the east and it, and it goes across the sky and it goes down every morning in the west. And, so and that's exactly why, that. right. And that's exactly why they, they locked up uh, Copernicus because Copernicus, <laughs> because he yeah. was crazy. He was crazy. They said he was a heretic, right? He said the earth revolves around the sun and us being egotists, we said, oh, no, 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 we're the center of the universe. The sun revolves around us. And they called him crazy and put him in jail. Yeah, but, yeah. He, but he was right. Same thing with Galileo. He said the same thing. I remember you told me in our, in our first conversation that you were just genuinely curious about these people because yeah. you grew up internationally and you were just always curious. And, and, and I, I know Derek has, has got a couple of thoughts on, on curiosity as, as a mental shield, if you will. The fact that you approach these conversations with a genuine thought of how come? right? Mm -hmm. The fact that you're approaching these conversations and you genuinely are interested in learning because it doesn't add up to you plays a large part in the fact that you're able to do it with no emotion. In other words, it's, it's hard for you to be triggered and curious at the same time. And no I think negative emotion. Yeah. Negative emotion. So it, it's, 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 it's hard for you to, to succumb to negative emotion and be curious at the same time. And, you know, when Chris told me about who you were and what you had done, it was, it was obviously a head scratcher for me. Right. Cause I'm like, well, I gotta, I gotta figure out how this guy was able to do it. And, and the answer has been in my face the entire time. You stay genuinely curious. It prevented you from succumbing to negative emotions, which, which, which handcuffed your behavior mm -hmm. and let you stay focused on the mission, which was, gaining that understanding. Right, exactly. And, I, and, I, and let me just tell you about emotion. You know, it's, it's excellent observation I, and I, that's spot on because when these people walk into the room and they see me, you know, they're expecting a white guy to interview them. You know, and how many black guys are writing books from the Klan and interviewing, it, 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 they didn't exist. So when they walk in the room and they see me, boom, their wall goes right up. Their defenses come on, they're ready to radiate, you know, vitriol, because I am not the object of their affection, right? And so, the, you know, they're ready to attack. And, um, and so, they, so, you know, they have to let me know that I am inferior and that they are superior. That's what makes them a supremacist, because they are supreme. Um, and, you know, so, so they got to get those perspectives right and make sure I understand that. And so that's why I'm told I'm a criminal, I'm on welfare, I'm, I'm unintelligent or whatever. And now while this person is sitting there, my, my, my objective is to learn, all right? And I want to bring the wall down. You know, you cannot plant any kind of a seed or impart any kind of information to anybody if their wall is up. Because when their wall is up, they're like this. Yeah, they're shutting you out. The wall has to, the temperature and the wall has to come down before they can hear you, right? So while I'm sitting there and this guy is telling me that I'm a criminal and because I'm black and I'm on welfare and I'm unintelligent, et cetera, is, is what he is saying offensive? Yes, absolutely. It is offensive. Am I offended by it? Absolutely not. And the reason why I'm not offended by it is because I know it's not true. How can this guy just walk into a room and all he sees is this and he's going to make these assertions about me? He doesn't know me. Why, why should I, why should I be um, offended by a lie? Now, if my mother or father were to tell me, Daryl, you know, you're, you know, you're, you're lazy, you know, you don't clean your room or, or, you know, you're, you know, you're unintelligent, you know, you're kind of dumb. 
maybe I would believe them because they raised me, they brought me into this world. But I'm not gonna believe somebody who just walked in my room 10 minutes ago and knows nothing about me and tells me this. You know, I, I'm gonna keep my emotions behind me. All right, so I'm, just, I, I'm, I'm gonna show him some of those core elements. I'm gonna allow him to be heard. I'm gonna show him that respect and I'm, I'm treating him fairly. I'm listening to him. I'm giving him that platform, right? So in doing so, I'm lowering the wall and I'm throwing him off of his game because he's never gone for more than 30 or 45 seconds with some black guy who he's telling is stupid and he's calling the guy a criminal, you know, there's gonna be pushback. And it may be verbal, it may escalate to physical. And then the whole process devolves into nothing. It shuts down. So I'm just listening. And by the time he gets done and exhausted of radiating this vitriol, he's, he's very curious. How come this guy hasn't said anything? What, you know, what, I, I wanna know what he thinks. And I just told, told him black people are stupid and they're criminals and they're on welfare. Yeah, he, he, has, he hasn't pushed back. So now he, he's more receptive to hearing what I have to say because he's used to being pushing somebody's buttons and they push back. So now it's my turn to talk. I could go on the offense. I could attack him and say, no, you are the criminal. You are the one hanging black men from trees and bombing black churches and dragging black men behind pickup trucks. And I would be 100% correct because the Klan has a history of doing that kind of thing. But if I go on the offense like that, the walls will go right back up, right? So I wanna keep the wall down. Rather than go on the offense, I go on the defense. And I say, listen, I hear what you're saying. However, I'm, I'm black. I don't have a criminal record. I've never been on welfare. I've never measured my brain size, but I'm sure it's the same size as anybody else's. And as far as my SAT scores go, my SAT scores got me into Howard University and I graduated with a, with a bachelor's degree. Now I'm saying all this knowing, because I've already done my homework on him. I know him, he, he doesn't know that I know, but this guy barely made it out of high school. So I know that I have more intelligence in my little fingernail than he and his whole clan put together. But if I throw that in his face, his walls will go back up. So I just talk about myself. So um, what happens is he goes home and he reflects on this conversation. And he's like, man, I just had a three hour conversation with a black man, you know, and we didn't come to blows. And, and, what, and what this Daryl Davis guy said about such and such, it makes sense. Oh, but, he, but he's black. But what he said was true. Oh, but he's black. So they began having a cognitive dissonance where mm. they realize the truth is there, but it's coming from a black source. So that does not compute because I'm inferior, he's superior. So how, how did this black guy know the truth? So that becomes their dilemma. And the dilemma is, do I consider, um, do, do I disregard this black guy's skin color and believe the truth because I know it to be true and change my direction? Or do I consider his skin color and continue living a lie just because of his skin color? That's their dilemma. And so fortunately for me, most of the people that I deal with have chosen to go the right way. There will always be those, a percentage, who will go to their grave being hateful, violent, and racist. But even if those people take the opportunity to sit down and have a conversation, there is an opportunity to plant that seed and give them food for thought. And, and as I was saying before, you know, one's perspective is one's reality. Whether that reality uh, is real or not, it's their reality. And you, it's impossible to change somebody's reality if you go after their reality. You can't tell them you're wrong, blah, blah, blah. You know, you're, you're, you're attacking their reality and they're gonna defend it. So don't go after their reality. Here's how you make that reality change. Um, let me give you an example. It, it works with kids, it work, works with adults. So you, let's say you take uh, a kid, maybe seven or eight years old to, to a magic show and um, the magician asks for uh, some female volunteers from the audience, a female one. So of course, you know, 50 girls raise their hand and the musician selects one of those girls. She comes up on stage, he, he puts her in this long box, puts her feet out that end and puts her head out this end, closes the lid. He takes a chainsaw and saws the box in half. And then he moves this half to stage left and that half to stage right. So her feet are down there and heads over here. 
to that seven or eight year old, year old kid, that magician, David Copperfield or whoever he is, sawed that woman in half. That is real. He sawed her in half because I right. see her legs there. I see her head there. And then right. he takes the, the two halves, puts them back together, opens the lid and out she pops and she's all whole. You cannot change that kid's reality. He knows what he saw, you know? And now, so if you attack his reality, it's not gonna work. What you do is you offer alternative perspectives. Right. You say, hey, you know, could it be that perhaps the girl that he chose from the audience was somebody that he stuck out there and, and, and he, he, she knows the trick and, and she comes up on stage, he puts her in the box, she bends her knees up to her chest so her whole body is in this half of the box and those are some mannequin legs sticking out of that side. So you're, you're giving him a different perspective and you're opening up his mind and then he gets it. Yeah, okay, that's how it was done. So he changes his own reality. That's how you, how, how you make reality change, not by attacking their reality, but by offering different perspectives. Don't tell somebody what to think, teach them how to think. Right. And you're not forcing it down their throat either. Exactly. I mean, you're, you're offering it for their consideration, which doesn't take away their autonomy. It gives them the opportunity to uh, consider it at their own pace. How many, how many interviews like that have you conducted? Oh, my gosh. Um, I would say over 100. I mean, I've been doing this 37 years. Sometimes it's, conducted... just casual. Sometimes it's just casual in my car. Sometimes yeah. it's over lunch. Sometimes it's at a rally. Sometimes it's formal, you know, come to this motel room, we'll sit down and record it or whatever. I'm struck by the fact that you understand that all of us have a desire to be heard and respected. All of us want to be listened to. And, and, and that's something that we preach over and over again, that, that your counterpart wants you to understand what the lay of the land looks like from their perspective. And you, you did that without any formal training so successfully that you spent three hours with a guy who under any other circumstances would rather see you dead. And I think that that is just, that is probably some of the most powerful evidence that if people would just sit back and hear out the other side, bring their defenses down, because as you pointed out, when, when, in, when negative emotions are high, rational thinking is a low and, and you, you did the physical manifestation of putting your hands over your ears. Uh, but what in reality is going on is that he views you as a threat and you can exacerbate that threat by what comes out of your mouth. That amygdala fires up, that free prefrontal cortex shuts down and he can't process the way he otherwise could. And I, I, I salute you, sir. I think that's, that's brilliant. Um, and like I said before, the, 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 the process that you were going through to get these interviews done was sitting right in front of my face and I never recognized it. And um, I applaud you. Well, thank you. You know, I mean, I, I didn't have any formal training in that regard, but I think, you know, the travel and the exposure to the different cultures was probably my, my training and I wasn't realizing at the time. Because, you know, as a diplomat, not me, but my, my, my father, you know, that's his job to foster better relations between foreign countries and the United States as a foreign service officer in the diplomatic corps. Um, he did a lot of listening to people. We saw a lot of the different things, you know, that we didn't, that we didn't do in this country um, and that kind of thing. So, you know, I, I'm learning to accept and listen to other people and process it and realize everybody has their own way of, of thinking about things. Uh, I'll give you an example of something. Uh, we were in Ghana, uh, in Accra, Ghana for two years. And um, we had some people, uh, you know, working for us, the embassy supplies, some people to work in your home and a driver and a day guard, a night guard, a laundry man, a cook, a maid, et cetera. Well, my mom had um, left her wristwatch inside her dress pocket and she'd forgotten about it and she put it in the hamper and it had gone down downstairs to the laundry and then she remembered it. So she went down laundry and um, nobody could find it. There was a, the laundry man, uh, his son and his son's friend you know, they took, you know, one would iron the clothes, one would hang them, one would wash them or whatever. 
Anyway, um, they couldn't find it. It searched everywhere, the washing machine, everywhere, no watch. And the, the uh, laundry man, he was you know, convinced, well, if Mrs. Davis said she put her watch in the pocket, that's where it was. Somebody has taken this watch. Somebody knows where this watch is. So all the, all the domestic servants were questioned. Had they seen the watch? Nobody saw it. So he wanted to go. He wanted everybody, except for, the, for, the, for my family, he wanted everybody, to all the employees, to go to what we would call a witch doctor. And, uh, and the witch doctor would determine who took the watch. So of course we wanted to go because you know when in Rome you do as the Romans. You know this is something you know we don't have over here. So you know we want to check this out and, and learn. So we went along too. And um, so all all the employees came. Uh, we didn't have to take the test. We just sat there and, and observed. This guy, this witch doctor person, he lined up all the employees in a in a row, and he had a fish hook on a fishing line, and you know a fish hook has those serrated blades. So it goes in, but doesn't come out, right? He had everybody stand like this with their mouths open. I am not kidding you. He took that fish hook and he dropped it down each person's throat. And while the fish hook was down their throat, he asked them in, in their native tongue, did you take the watch? And they said, ah, uh, like, no. He pulled it right out. It, it never snagged. He got to the friend of the washman's son, dropped it down there and asked him. He said, no. The guy went to pull it out. It snagged in his throat, this fish hook. He, and he said something to the effect of, you know, yes, you did, you took the watch, whatever. When the kid admitted it, it released and it came right out. That's impossible. It came right out, right? So then he, he, he says to the kid, where is the watch? And the kid said he had it at home. The man said, you go home and you bring it back here right now. That kid took off running. He ran to his house, wherever it was. He came back, I don't know, maybe 15, 20 minutes later and gave this witch doctor person my mother's watch. The witch doctor then gave it to my mother. And then the witch doctor had a little pouch. Uh, it was like a leather hide, like maybe from an antelope or something. And it had some stuff inside this hide. And he gave this pouch to my father and told my father to hang it in the, in the archway, the threshold of the door. It was like a mojo. It would prevent evil spirits from entering uh, through that door into the house. And, you know, I, I, I rarely tell that story to, to people back home here because they would never believe it, but I saw it. And, you know, that was their form of lie detector. But you know what? It worked. Just like, you know, we, 30 years ago, this country was laughing at acupuncture and now insurance right. companies pay for acupuncture. Chinese people have been doing acupuncture for 2,000 years. If it didn't work, they wouldn't be doing it 2,000 years later, right? It works. So, you know, this, this lie detector thing worked. And, and when I do tell people, you know, they don't believe me. They, they want to try to explain it. Well, you know, you know, when you lie, your muscles tighten up. And so that's probably why the thing snagged. Okay, that's fine. Your muscles tighten up and, and it snags on a fish hook. But guess what? I've never seen a fish's muscles uh, loosen up and, and let, and and let, let that go. fish hook. Yeah. So, you know, you can explain however you want to explain it. It worked. And my, and my mom got her watch back. So, you know, I, I, you know I'm, I'm just telling you one of many stories from my childhood. I saw all kinds of, of, of stuff that's unbelievable. So, so when I, when you, I grew, saw, you grew up in a, you grew up in a world that was just utterly fascinating. You were fascinated exactly, by everything you exactly. saw. Exactly. So, you know, why wouldn't I accept, you know, these crazy guys who believe that my skin color gives me some right. inferiority or something. They, they're just another culture that of, of the many that I've seen. How has the people that you've interviewed changed? Has oh, there been any well, change in the, in the people? This is uh, Roger Kelly's robe. This is his, his Imperial Wizard robe. I gotta tell you, he went from Grand Dragon, state leader to Imperial Wizard, national leader. That's, that's the symbol I was telling you about. He gave this you is, that robe? Yeah, he gave me that robe. And I, I have over 50 robes and hoods from active members who, who and I became friends. This of course is um, the hood for that robe. This is the hood and this is the mask. The mask is attached to the hood by three snaps or Velcro. So if they want anonymity, they look at you here. You don't see them, they see you. If they don't care right. if their identity is revealed, they just unsnap the mask and the face is exposed under the hood. And I've got a ton of these things. I got neo-Nazi flags. I got all kinds of crap, man. Uh, observation and a question. Um, 
you know, to paraphrase Carl Rogers, you know, psychologist at active listening that Derek and I learned it from derived, you know, he said, if you, if you hear somebody completely out, you release potent forces for change within them. What do you think your batting average is? The people you sit down or I, the people that you've successfully released it changes? I know that, um, that I have been the impetus for just over 200 over the last 37 years to give up that ideology. Directly, I would say maybe between 40 and 60. But then when those people leave, they also influence others, their right. buddies who join with them. So just over 200. And then are the people you spoke to directly, because we always get asked, how much, what good is this going to do? And our answer is, you know, in negotiation, it doesn't matter because you're always going to be better off. But people always kind of want to know success rate. My, so my guess is your success rate for release and change with people is pretty high. But what would your gut instinct you know, I, I, I've never really thought about it that way. And you guys would probably be more qualified to to give me, you know, a, an analytical you know, data point on my success rate. But how I feel, because, you know, I, like I have my share of supporters. I also have my share of detractors, of course, you know, who, who think I'm wasting my time. It's not my job to teach white supremacists how to, how to treat me. And, you know, I've been called every name but my own. I've been called a sellout, an Uncle Tom, an Oreo, you name it, I've been called it. Um, but, I, you know, and, and, and they say, you know, what, what good does it do to change one person? You know, you, 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 you can't change a whole, you know, racist society. You, you know, you, you're, you're doing one person at a time. Well, let me tell you something. Um, suppose suppose uh, I had talked to Dylan Roof. There might be nine black people still doing Bible study today in South Carolina. Right. Suppose I talked to, um, to Robert Bowers. There might be 11 people still going to worship at the Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh. Well, your ripple effect too. I mean, who could you have saved, but you're 40 that turns into 200, you got a five to one ripple effect across humanity with that, mm -hmm. which is even more important. Now, um, right, that's a, <laughs> plan we talk. Nice. Yeah, that's, uh, that's about 28 years ago in, uh, in Frederick. You know, as you can see, I'm a, I'm a little thinner there. Got a little bit more hair on my head. That's towards the end. That's, <laughs> that's towards the uh, the end of a rally. I and, get the uh, same problem. <laughs> and um, I asked I asked this Klansman if he would uh, pose for a picture with me, and in front of the burning cross. So he did. So now this one is about four and a half, five years ago. That's in Missouri. Again, towards the end of a rally. There's some more Klan people there that, that are off camera over by a picnic table, or whatever. And um, so they're ending their rally there. And so what do I do at these things? When I go, I engage in dialogue with people, like there. All right, um, the guy with the uh, green cross on his mask. Um, when I came on that rally ground, he threatened me, and to, and to, this is like I said, almost five years ago. Uh, to this day, he sends me a Christmas present every Christmas. Um, the guy, the guy on the left side of the screen with the rebel flag on his arm, uh, his name is Frank Ancona. You should look him up sometime. A N C O N A. Um, Frank Ancona, KKK. He had the largest Klan group in the country, and he was murdered uh, February of, uh, of uh, 2017. Um, now, I'm going to show you this uh, this clip. This clip came from from 19, I think 94, 95. Uh, a rally I went to. CNN covered it. You're going to see Roger Kelly, the guy I was talking about, right? Uh, yeah. wh whose robe I have. You'll see him wearing this very same robe. Um, let's see here. Um, I want you to listen to what Roger Kelly says. Uh, I went to one of his Klan rallies, and um, you know CNN uh, you know, wanted to to uh, from you know because they'd, they'd heard about me, and they wanted to to go to a Klan rally with me. So uh, Roger Kelly had invited me to one of his, and um, I asked him if CNN could come, and they said he said yeah. And so CNN said to me, "Do you think he'll even talk to us?" I said, "I'll do better than that. When the rally is over, I'll get him to come to my house." And you can interview the Imperial Wizard of the Klan because by this time he had gone from Grand Dragon to Imperial Wizard. I said you can interview you can interview the Imperial Wizard of the Klan inside my house, inside a black man's house. I'll invite him back to my house, and you can interview him there. So they interviewed him here at my house, and um, he said that even though he and I would do different things together, it did not change his views on the Klan because his views on the Klan had been cemented in his mind for years. And then he goes on to say how he believes in separation of the races, because he finds that to be in the best interest of all races. But listen towards the end of this little clip, 
about what he says about respect, and then you'll understand where, where I'm coming from with that. Friendship can transcend all kinds of boundaries. Just look at us. And two men in Washington area are showing that even an African-American man and a member of the Ku Klux Klan can find common ground. CNN's Carl Rochelle reports. Carol Davis plays a hot piano. It's part of the show, and it makes him stand out. He also stands out here. Davis is one of the few African-Americans you will ever find attending a KKK rally. More than attending, he is welcome. I got more respect for that black man than I do you white right. out there. It's been a tough day for the Klan. Their Maryland rally found many local residents rejecting the message of white separatism. After it's over, Daryl Davis hangs around backstage with his friend, Klan wizard Roger Kelly. It's not unusual for blacks and whites to be friends, but it is unusual to find a black man and a Klan leader chatting pleasantly over an orange soda after a Klan rally. The relationship started over a book Davis was writing. His secretary set up an interview with Roger Kelly, but didn't tell him Davis was black. They talked and talked some more. Davis learning about the Klan, Kelly learning about Davis. We get to know one another and we do different things, you know, it's... It hasn't changed my views about the Klan, you know, because my views on the Klan has been pretty much cemented in my mind for years. Kelly and his Klan friends go to hear Davis and his band. And Davis goes to their rallies. I sat on, on, on the front row and, uh, and listened to each uh, Klansman speak. Um, some things I agreed with, other things I did not agree with. Davis thinks that his presence promotes badly needed understanding. Hate stems, I believe, from fear, from fear of the unknown. And I think this is all across the board, regardless of whether it's a Klansman or anything else. But he has no illusions about the Klan. If he did, his friend would be quick to disabuse them. And I believe in separation of the races. I believe that's in the best interest of all races. Does he really? Or has friendship transcended the color barrier? Listen to Kelly at a Klan rally. I'm a far out man to hell, because I believe in what he stands for and he believes in what I stand for. A lot of times we don't agree with everything, but at least he respects me to sit down and listen to me. And I'll respect him to sit down and listen to him. The strange relationship of a KKK wizard and his black buddy. In Washington, I'm Carl Rochelle, CNN Sunday Morning. Strange. Good adjective. Strange. Certainly okay. that. So you heard him say that even though he and I did different things together, it did not change his views on the Klan because his views on the Klan had been cemented in his mind for years and how he believes in separation of the races because he figures that to be in the best interest of all races. But you also heard him say at the very end of that clip that he respected me. He's the Imperial Wizard, a national leader in the, in the KKK. He respected me, a black man. What he said was, we may not agree on everything, but at least he respects me to sit down and listen to me and I respect him to sit down and listen to him. There you go. Those are, those are those core values that that uh, I mentioned and, and that Derek mentioned of being yeah. heard, being listened to, right? That respect. I'm not respecting what he's saying. I'm not a supremacist or a separatist or a nationalist okay. or a racist, but I'm giving. I, I'm respecting his right to say it. And so, right. because I gave him that, he reciprocated, and he allowed me exactly to be heard, right. right? And as a result of those conversations, is how I ended up with this with this very same robe that you saw him wearing in that in that clip the whole thing is fascinating to me you you know i'm lucky that i know chris voss because chris voss has introduced me some to some of the most incredible people on the planet um and you're included in one of them because you're making the world a better place and you understand that in order to do that you've got to subordinate yourself to the other side to the people that you're dealing with in order to show them that respect because you showing it first encourages reciprocity. And um, that last thing that you said is of critical importance. And that is, it's not about agreeing with, it's not about liking, it's not about buying into what the other side is saying. It's just you recognizing that it's their perspective. Right. And if more of us would carry ourselves like that, all interactions would go a lot smoother. The level of ignorance 
would diminish. And if, and to your point, if we can get that level of ignorance mitigated, we won't have to worry about the fear, the hatred and the destruction that follows. Okay, so what do we got going on here? Um, this is uh, Charlottesville that day, August 12th, 2017. This is one of many scenes that took right. place. All right? right. And what's going on here, these guys coming down the steps on the left side, those are all Klansmen. Um, right. You don't know that because you don't see them in their robes and hoods. I know that because I know all of those guys individually. <laughs> I, I know them personally. Uh, the guy in, in the white shirt with the, with the Confederate flagpole trying to hit the black guy, uh, he's the Grand Dragon of Virginia. And uh, anyway, so they're coming down the steps from this Confederate statue park and the black guy has an improvised flamethrower aerosol can, right. he lit a match. Now, wh who you don't see in this picture is the Imperial Wizard, the national leader. He'd already come down the steps. He's about eight paces ahead. So he's out of the camera shot. And um, he, 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 he came down the stairs right as the guy was, uh, was um, spraying the spray and lighting the match you're gonna see a puff of uh, aerosol in the air. And, and you'll see the Imperial Wizard. He's wearing a black bandana, a blue jean vest and black jeans. You're gonna see him like duck under the, the mist. And then he'll come you know, towards you in the, in the screen and walk out a camera okay. shot. So he gets about here, he turns around and he sees what's going on. He sees this guy trying to set his people on fire or whatever. He, right. pulls, he pulls out a gun and he points it at the head of this black guy and he shouts, hey, nigger. and then he lowers the gun and fires it. And the bullet goes into the gravel right there in front of the black guy's feet. And then the wizard turns and continues walking in the direction which he was walking. The Charlottesville police are standing less than 10 feet away. They watch the whole thing go down. They're standing there in their green neon vests. They watch the whole thing go down and they did not move. They did absolutely nothing. And for that reason, and, and, and much more of their inaction that day, the uh, mayor of Charlottesville fired the Charlottesville police chief. And so yeah. now they have, they have a new police chief. So um, let's, watch, let's watch this video clip. There he is right there in the, the vest, right there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you see the police in the green neon over there. Okay, so now, you know, um, here's what we have to realize. You know, people in Los Angeles or in Boise, Idaho or Tuscaloosa, Alabama, you know, they may, or New York City, you know, they may think, oh, well, you know, that's Charlottesville. I don't have to worry about that. Yes, you do have to worry about it because anywhere there's hate, that can happen in any city USA. And, right. and, if, and if you're an American, I don't care where you live, uh, Charlottesville is your city. Every American city is your city because America Take is your Take responsibility for, your, for your, yourself. Don't exactly. pretend like it's just someplace else. Exactly, because if you're an American, this country is your country and every city within it is your city. So, right. um, and, and your country can only become one of two things. It can become that which you sit back and watch it become, or it can become that which you stand up and make it. So you have right. to ask yourself the question, do I wanna sit back and see what my country becomes or do I wanna stand up and make my country become what I wanna see? So right. I chose the latter. So you saw the guy in his street clothes, the Imperial Wizard, right. uh, this, this is him in his um in his clan attire there he is okay so okay. i i called the dude up i called him up on the phone <laughs> of course I, you did of course i did that's what i do and um I, I, I said look man i said you you know you and i need to talk not not clansman to black man but man to man american to american i said your confederate history is just as much a part of my black history as my black history is a part of your of your history. I said it's wow. all Amer it's all American history. Let's you and I get together and explore American history. So I talked to him for about half an hour on the phone. He agreed. So we set wow. a date. Yeah, we set a date. I drove by myself an hour and a half to his house, and I sat I sat in his living room 
KKK stuff all over the walls, Confederate stuff. I sat wow. on his couch. Yeah, I sat on his couch. His couch was covered with a Confederate flag blanket. And so I sat there and his, his clans lady fiance was there. So I listened to them give me a two hour lecture on, on American history from a Confederate perspective, of course, right? So I right. just sat there, I listened to him. Some things he got right, some things he got wrong, but I listened. And when he got done, it was my turn to talk. So I corrected him on the things that he got wrong and I commended him on the things that he got right. But wow. I said, but I said before you know, I get into my little part, here's what I wanna do. I said, there's a new museum that opened up in DC called the Smithsonian uh, National uh, Museum of African American Heritage and History and Culture. I said, I have some connections there. I can get some tickets for us. I said, let me get some tickets. We'll set a date and you and your fiance, the plans lady, you all come down to my house in Silver Spring, Maryland. And, and I will drive you down to the museum. I said, let's, let's the three of us explore that museum together. He said, okay. So I got the tickets, we set the date. They came down to my house. We sat here in my living room for a little bit. I put them in my car and I drove to DC and we went to the museum. And um, this is us entering the largest music, the largest black history museum in the world, right? Um, notice what he's wearing on, on his head there. Okay, his, his rebel right. flag, okay? And that's the plans lady there, his fiance. So wow. what do we, yeah, so what do we do while we're in here? You guys are mod squad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so um, we, we, looked at, we looked at displays on slavery, on segregation, on integration. We watched little video clips on uh, blacks in the arts, blacks in science, in education, in medicine, in sports, in music, et cetera. And um, his favorite uh, music artist is Elvis Presley. And Elvis is one of my favorites too. But the man that I worked for, as you know, Chuck Berry, Chuck Berry invented rock and roll. Without Chuck Berry, there would be no Elvis. There would be right. no no Beatles, no Rolling Stones, no Rolling no, Stones, no Led yeah. Zeppelin, no anybody. Anybody yeah. who plays rock music, all of their DNA goes back to Chuck Berry. Chuck Berry. All right? Yeah. So Chuck had donated uh, one of his Cadillacs, cherry red Cadillac, to the museum, and it's on display there. So I said, hey, you know, let, let's go check out Chuck Berry's car. You know, I, I've seen it at Chuck's house, but um, you know, he'd never seen it. Wow. So, so now, now, now you see him there. You see him. He's holding the Klan's lady. He's holding his fiance, right? Uh, yeah. Well, here, okay. So here's a picture of me working with Chuck Berry. Okay, that's who he's playing Johnny B. Good there, going into his guitar solo and into the duck walk, right? So, uh -huh. now we, so now we go to the to Chuck's car. There's a car behind him. Now, now who's holding the clans lady, the fiance? You see how fast wow. I work. Wow. You see how fast I work. <laughs> Human beings, man. Human beings. Yeah. Okay. So. So we, we toured this museum for about two and a half hours. You know, it's impossible to take in everything in that, in that short time. I mean, you, you cannot even, even absorb every, everything in two and a half months, it's that vast. But I figured two and a half hours is enough. So I said, okay, you know, let's, let's leave. So we go outside, I give her, the plans lady, I give her my camera on my cell phone. I said, here, take a picture of the Imperial Wizard in me. And I walk and I stand over next to the marquee outside the museum. And this is what he did, totally unscripted, totally unplanned. There. So ah. this, this is a little bit less than a year. Holy cow. A little bit less than a year after he pulled out that gun and said, hey, dear. boom, right? So- uh, Holy cow. He did that, uh, he, the, the, the shooting incident was August 12th, 2017. This is the, towards the end of June, 2018. So just a little bit less than a year, all right? Now, because I've been working with him this whole year, you know, we've, we've developed a relationship, a friendship, right? He's gonna marry that girl in a couple of weeks from this picture. So I get invited to the wedding. I get invited to a clan wedding, right? Now wow. it gets, but, but check it out, Chris, it goes even deeper than that. Human beings are crazy, all right? Her, she's from Chattanooga, Tennessee, her father, was too ill, too sick to come up this way to, to walk his daughter down the aisle and give her away. And rather than ask one of their trusted clan members that you saw walking down those steps with the, with the Confederate flag poles trying to hit somebody, they asked me, would I step in and walk her down the aisle? Wow. How crazy is that?
right? I said, sure. So here you go. There I am walking her down the aisle. Wow. You are now, a good man. You are a good man. <laughs> so You're this, a good man. They got married at their house. And if you look up on the second story in the bedroom window, you see the Confederate flag. Right. Yeah. So now, but but here's the point. Nobody changes overnight. So he no. still has a he still has a little ways to go. But at least now he's going in the right direction. Right. Okay. So now CNN had a, had interviewed him a long time back uh, about his activities and stuff, and he said he was going to be buried in his clan robe. So I asked him. I said, "Listen, you know, no black man has ever walked a clan woman down the aisle before." I said, "Would you mind if I contact CNN and ask them to cover this?" He said, "Okay." He trusts me a hundred percent. And he says, "He says just ask them not to film." The faces of my clan members he, you know they can film my face they can film fair enough you know right. yeah they can film his face the bride's face the preacher's face but not the members and so I, I said yeah i understand that so i told cnn they said okay so so they ran what he said on the banner you know i'll, I'll be buried in my clan robe whatever uh, un, un, under this thing so here here we are As you stand in the presence of God. This time, it was Davis giving something away. The bride. Gave me and his friendship has been something really special. She wanted me to be a part of this wedding. That's beautiful. That's a seed planted. So there you have the imperial wizard, the groom, the clan's lady, fiance, the bride, and the surrogate father. I can tell you something. Uh, I'm sitting here with my mouth open a vast majority of this conversation. <laughs> And I got one more thing to show you here. Okay, so now you 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 know all about lone wolves, you know for sure. Yeah. This next guy, all right, he 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 um he he was a a U.S. Navy chief petty officer. He served a tour in in uh, in two tours in Iraq, Af and I think one in Iraq, one in one in uh, Afghanistan. He was a U.S. Navy chief petty officer. And when he came back, he went on to become the Grand Dragon of the Klan for Florida, the state leader for Florida. At the same time, he became a ranking officer in the NSM, National Socialist Movement, which is the, high, the, the, the largest neo-Nazi organization in this country. Wow. So he had a swastika tattooed on one side of his chest and that, and that Klan emblem, that red circle white cross emblem yeah. tattooed on this side, right? And he hated Jewish people hated black people. And uh, I, I will guarantee you, I will guarantee you, Chris, if it had not been for me and another former white supremacist friend of mine um, and, and another black guy, this guy would have been the next lone wolf you would see walking into a church or a synagogue and wasting people. So here he is here. Um, that's him as, as the uh, chief Navy petty officer. And let me just pause for a second. And he made a statement. He said, um, all Jews are homosexuals and they all should be exterminated, every single one of them. This, this is what he said. And uh, he said he would never break bread with a Jew. And so he met this black guy in, his, in, in the parking lot of his apartment complex and they got to talking or whatever. And I knew who he was, he knew who I was. I'd never met him before. Of course, he didn't like me at the time. and. Um, he kept, you know, questioning his beliefs. And so, you know, the black guy kept talking to him. And so finally, he, this guy emailed me and we started talking in the email. He wanted to meet me and he sent me his phone number. We talked in email. I talked to him on the phone. I didn't have time to go down to Florida, but we talked for about, a, you know, a year or so. And like I said, a former neo-Nazi supremacist friend of mine uh, knew him and kept encouraging him to keep calling me, keep calling Daryl. And so eventually I had the time to go down to Florida because I had a gig. I had a gig for five days. And so on one of those days I had off. So I went from Orlando over to Jacksonville to meet him. By this time he was ready to give it up. He gave me his clan robe, all his neo-Nazi stuff. So I'm gonna show you this. This is, again, this is what he became. Jews and homosexuals, they should be exterminated. Every single one of them. <laughs> and that's him in his clan robe. And you know, you, you hear about people waking up in the morning and finding clan literature on their lawn. That that's what he would do. He'd go out mm -hmm. under the cover of darkness and throw this 
on people's lawns and stuff. It's, it's crap. So anyway, um, you know, I, I met with him. I went to his apartment. We all had dinner together. Uh, a Jewish lady friend of mine joined us. We all sat down, had dinner together. And um, we went back to his apartment. He gave me that robe that he's wearing right there. He gave me all his clan stuff, all his Nazi stuff. And he had his tattoos removed. So let me show you this here. This is inside his apartment. Mainly what you came for, but my grand dragon robe. Yeah. Uh, this is the hood where they never put eyes in it. So I had to tuck it up inside to wear it. Right. I can see where I'm going. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Thank you. You're welcome. And this is a belt that goes with it. Where's all that stuff going, Daryl? It was going into my museum. Having it removed. Yeah, laser burn, right? Wow. It'd be my pleasure to help him uh, remove those and start a new life. It just goes to show that people can really change. Life is great without the hate. Amen. Yeah. Um, so, you know, that's that's pretty much, you know, you know what I do, man. You are a prince of a human being. You are you know, you're this, a good man. This is the stuff, you know, they, they don't show on TV, man. But it goes on behind the scenes. And that's... You know, people need to know this, you know, that people can yeah. change. And this is why we, I, I, I'm so heavily into advocating for education and exposure, because that's the cure to, to cure ignorance. So we yeah. can avoid all the other crap, the fear, the yeah. hatred, the destruction, you know? Yeah. And, and I, would guarantee, I would guarantee you that last guy you saw, had, had, had we not intervened, he, he would be the one you'd be seeing on TV right now, who, who just shot up... Not, 10 people in some church or whatever. Right. Yeah, well, we're going to get this out there. We're going to put it on a YouTube channel. We're going to push this out. I'm looking forward to, to diving more into this stuff. Okay. As this continues, man. Absolutely, man. Absolutely. Thank, thank you for your time. My pleasure. Okay, talk to you soon. We'll talk soon.